And um, essentially their winter, they're coming from England where the weather is like cold and damp and miserable and hit the beaches immediately. And there's nobody on any of the beaches. <laughs> and it's like 75 degrees Fahrenheit, right? There's, there's nobody on the beaches. And then we realized, you know, it's a, swimming is a culturally determined phenomenon. You just don't go in the winter. And, you wait till the summer and it's 105 degrees and off you go. So, so anyway, you end up in West Australia. Department of Anthropology, and I'd taken one anthropology course ever. That was with Tom McFeet at Carleton University in I think third year, second or third year. It's the only course I ever took. And I missed all of the courses. I couldn't take any of the courses. I was too late arriving. So I had to write their, exa their examinations without any courses. The, the advantage was that they were fairly general, involving other subjects than strictly anthropology, like uh, pl some political science and things. So I'd read enough that I could kind of do that. And, I knew my, and I'd read more of Lévi-Strauss, so I knew a lot about that. So anyway, so I wrote these exams, and instead of doing the master's preliminary, they told me I could skip the master's and go straight to the PhD, which I thought, was, wow. And it was the British system. It wasn't the North American system. It was the British system back then, where there's no coursework. They choose a place for you to go. You go there. They say goodbye, and you come back to them with a completed thesis. No supervision, basically. I mean, you, there, there isn't a sense that you're reading. And so I decided to, uh, I want to go work with the Aborigines. That's what I wanted to do. People in my department, other professors in my department said, we already know everything there is to know about the Aborigines. You should go study fishermen off the coast of Broome in West Australia, Portuguese fishermen. And people were trying to persuade me not to go to the Aborigines. And I said, no, I'll, I, I, this is what I want to do, right? Anyway, my prof, Ron Burnt, he picked out a place called, like I said, Groot Island in the Northern Territory in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And uh, the reason he chose that place was that um, the only anthropologist who'd been there before was Peter Worsley. And there were two communities. One was uh, a secular community, on, one part of the island, about 250 Aborigines. The other was a mission on this side of the island, about 350 Aborigines, okay? Peter Worsley was not allowed to go to the mission. He was barred from it because he was known to be a Marxist. The only reason Peter Worsley went to Groot Island because he was barred to go to New Guinea, which is where he wanted to go in the first place. They wouldn't let him go there either. In 1940, I think it was 1940-41, a fellow named Fred Rose had been on a flying boat base on Groot Island during the war, well, in the early years of the war. They, they built um, Air Force bases in the Northern Territory, which they thought would be out of the range of the Japanese bombers. So Groot Island was you know, far enough away that they could do flying boat bases there. But they were strictly forbidden from interacting with the Aborigines, so very small. Anyway, this guy, Fred Rose, went there. Fred Rose subsequently defected to East Germany. He became a guy going the other direction. And, um, and then he came back later, spent, I think, two or three months on the Aborigines. He recorded kinship data. But he didn't record it the way anthropologists usually do, which is genealogies. He didn't do genealogies. He did clan histories. So he'd ask you, what's your mother's clan? What's your father's clan? What's your mother's mother's clan? Father's mother's clan? And then he'd stop there, go to the next person. And then he'd record this for about 200, over 200 people. So, that he, and then he published it in a book. And... Uh, Kinship and age structure amongst Groot Island Aborigines. 
So there was that. And then Peter Worsley, I think he spent four months there at Umbacumba on the other side of the island. He published a, uh, a thesis, but he never, he never did anything with it. It just remained a thesis, right? So my professor's idea was to send me to the mission because essentially no one had ever been there. And the Aborigines from the mission were from a different place. They were from Bickerton Island, adjacent to Groot Island, and the mainland. So they were a different kind of culture, right? And the missionaries would allow us to go because we were an ideal couple, young, uh, no children, blah, blah, blah. You know. We didn't have any political affiliations, so we were kind of safe, right? So that's what we did. So Ruth and I, we uh, hopped up the coast on a DC-9 with the doors open, stopping at all these little whistle stops. Get to Darwin, and in those days Darwin was just a little cow town, like just a, a country town, no air conditioning, fans, it was hot as hell. Tropical North Australia. And we had to barge everything over to Groot Island because the planes were too small to do in there. They had an airstrip. Mining had just started in the, about 65, 66. Manganese had been discovered. And the missionaries, the mission signed a lease for the Aborigines with the government and the mining company, completely independent of the Aborigines. So they were stuck with it. So we got there just as this was getting underway and the white people were coming up from down south to work on this mine, right? And so it became a very politically sensitive area. So every two months I had to have my permit renewed because if I was making trouble, I was gone. So what we did is I dealt with the Aborigines and Ruth dealt with the missionaries. So we kind of divided that up. And she was brilliant at languages and the women wouldn't talk to her in English. So she had to learn the language quickly. And within four months, she was almost fluent. And to this day, they still remember her as the only white woman who ever spoke the language properly. Me, I was back to front. Because <laughs> I was like learning a working knowledge. I knew what I had to do and I had specific things I wanted the language for, not kind of everything, right? So I was looking at, well, I was looking at, well, actually, we didn't know what we were looking at initially. When we got there, I had to find out how to accommodate my skills to that environment because I didn't know how to do a genealogy. I didn't know how to do conventional anthropology, all right? But I knew a lot of sociology. I knew a lot of political science. And the government had given the Aboriginal community uh, at Angarugu, the mission, $40,000 to start up a fishing venture, give them a, buy a boat. And they would catch fish and then sell them to the mining company, but give the money to the mission. You know how that works, right? So anyway, I figured, okay, start there, right? Because I could handle that. It's kind of an economic enterprise. Blah, blah, blah. So we get there, and uh, the first few days we're there, we find out that they forgot to put oil in the motor and the engine had blown up and the boat is gone. So there was no fishing venture. So we were sitting there thinking, okay, what are we going to do, right? So we think, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put a tent up in the middle of the community if we get permission from the Aborigines. And I'm just going to record everything every day. Whatever happens, write it down. So you keep this big flow chart, a big diary of events, and then connect them up. So if there's a ceremony, you connect the ceremony, and then who's doing the ceremony? Why are they the ones doing the ceremony, not these other people? And you start doing that, eh? What's their relationship to each other? All this kind of stuff. So that's what, that's what we did. We just built this, uh, what do you, what would you call it? Kind of a, a matrix of everyday life in this place, right? And of course, everything happened. They had ceremonies, occasionally they had fights, they occasionally, you know, all kinds of things going on and hunting, fishing, all kinds of stuff. And then after two months, you had to have your permit renewed, so you had to be careful. Because the more you got into it, the more suspicious the missionaries, because they never talked to me, because they never saw me, right? So they were always wondering what I was doing all the time, getting into trouble. And I wasn't doing anything. I was just trying to do what, do what I was doing. And then halfway through my field work, about six months into it, the government sent up a guy called Jeremy Long, who was a patrol officer, a really nice guy. 
And he had instructions to buy out half my research grant from the Institute of Aboriginal Studies so that my data would be available to the government. Well, that did not go over. <laughs> so I said no, and I immediately phoned my prof up. I got in touch with my pro Ronald Burnt in Perth and told him. And there was a big, big mess about it. And eventually they backed off, right? Imagine, I was going to be a spy for the government and the missionaries about what the Aborigines really thought about the mining. And I knew from that point on I was in trouble. They were, they were watching us really closely, right? So six months comes up, another renewal. And eight months comes up, another renewal. So we're just hanging in there. trying to, And of course, because you know you might be out of there any day, you're working like hell to get as much of the stuff done and your information. And you're just beginning to understand at the end. You don't understand at the beginning. You're just being, building up this understanding as you're going through it. Eh? And um, so the Aborigines in English used to call me the man who never stops for lunch. <laughs> that was my nickname. It changed later and as I went back later in life. But So anyway, so we got to the end of the year and we, we, we that was it. You're gone. So we had to leave, right? And uh, went back to Perth. And then what I did was uh, what uh, a lot of students, PhD students, they don't, maybe can't do it, but I sat in a room for six months. You know, I ate and went out a bit writing. That's all I did. Ruth worked. I sat in a room and I wrote. I wrote while everything was fresh. The language was fresh. The biographies were fresh. It was all in my head. And I wrote until I finished 420 pages. And that was my thesis. I just, I just wrote it. And there's no computers. You're on carbons. You make a mistake, you do the whole thing over again. And that's in there. The green thing at the end there, that's, that's it. And um, it's, it's eventually got published as Tradition and Transformation. So what was it exactly? That it, well, oh, I should tell you what happened to the thesis, I guess. Being in Perth in West Australia, you're too far away from everybody to fly people in. It's too expensive. So you don't have a committee and you don't have a defense. They pick the three top people in the world in your field and just send it out. And you just sit there and wait for the reply <laughs> to come back. So you don't get to defend yourself. And, the, and it isn't like they're sending it to somebody, whatever. They're sending it to Mervyn Maggot, Peter Worsley, and W.E.H. Stanner. And you're like, hello? <laughs> I d I've never met these people. I don't know who they are. I mean, I know who they are. But they're like, Peter Worsley has been there before, so he knows the culture. And uh, Mervyn Maggot, of course, he's worked in Central Australia with the Walpuri. And W.H. Stanner is a legend, worked up in the Northwest Coast. So I'm just, you just sit there and you wait for a few months and months. And, and eventually the reports come back. And uh, the reports were basically, this is a groundbreaking work in the history of Aboriginal studies. And I got special commendation on my PhD. Why? I think to myself, what was so special about this? I didn't see anything special. What I'd done, basically, I wrote it in the language. The whole thesis is more or less written in the language. It's just, it's not a theoretical understanding of Aboriginal culture. It's how the thing works, how the, it all fits together and works. So it's like an engineering exercise, right? Not a theoretical treatise. And that's what I like doing. I like figuring out how things work. And that's all I, so we did our flow chart. We figured out how all the little things and events all fit together, and I wrote it up. And then you had to have chapters and stuff, but basically that was it. Um, it covered like aspects of the religion, aspects of the economy and stuff, all that. But there was some, I didn't know it at the time, but there was something missing, and it was a perspective that would change how you look at not only how it, fits together, but the underlying premises of the whole thing, why it works the way it does. Yeah, you can see 
how the thing fits together and how the mechanics are, but you don't know the underlying thing that makes it all tick, right? That I found out many, many years later. So anyway, so from that point on, it was trying to get back up there from after finishing my PhD, trying to get back up. And uh, it was very difficult to get back because once we, we left, there was no way the missionaries were going to have us go back there. And we were just too much of a threat. And eventually it all kind of, I mean, eventually you take sides with the Aborigines, right? So I was reporting their objections to the mining at meetings and things. And they were not, they just didn't want to know. In fact, they were overly calling me a liar that the Aborigines were in favor of the mining. And they, I watched old men cry when the bulldozers took out a sacred hill and leveled it for a, you know, to build so, something for the mining company. The old men sitting there crying. These were the spirits of the ancestors sitting out there. And these people were just desecrating them. And nobody listened. They were not, and manganese is strategic resource. It's used in the smelting of steel. It's the world's largest producer. They're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. So they didn't. And so, and then all this, stories start floating around about Fred Rose was a communist and he couldn't get back. And the Aborigines didn't know what a communist was, but they knew what Germans were because the missionaries would show them the Germans fighting against us in the, in the war. They'd show films of that. So Fred Rose was a German. He wasn't coming back. Uh, for me, it was just keep them out. So uh, I tried to get back in 1971. I got a grant from the Institute of Aboriginal Studies to study uh, the art. And um, some of the old artists were still around. These were the old people who were born in the bush and didn't know anything about Europeans, right? Like this is first contact, first serious contact was during the Second World War. So you're looking at fairly recent. There was some early contact, but not, it was sporadic. So there wasn't really intense contact until Second World War. And even then it wasn't that intense. And these old, these old people, they didn't have any interest in us at all. They, they, didn't, they lived in a different space. You could just look into the, their eyes and you could tell. These people, they, they were just somewhere else. And they'd sing in ceremonies, in mortuary ceremonies. And you could see they were, they were there, but they weren't there. And I, one of the puzzling things when I was doing translating songs for my thesis was there'd be somebody singing a song and they'd be sitting there and I'd be recording it and the song would be about them seeing something somewhere else on, the, on another island or on the mainland. And I thought it was metaphorical, right? It's, it wasn't. They were there describing the landscape, what was happening at that moment. They were in the moment there in two places. They were sitting here and they were there. I didn't understand that at the time. I just recorded it, right? It took me 20 years before I figured that out, that they actually were there. And uh, uh, it was amazing. And Gula could do that. Gula did that and taught me a bit about it. And I did it once, I did it once later on myself. So I know, I believe it. I wouldn't believe it unless I'd done it, but I did it. So two places at the same time. I don't know if you want to hear about that later, but it's pretty interesting. It's different. See, once you get into the culture, you either get into it or get out of it. You shouldn't be halfway in. And I think so, what a lot of people complained about, a lot of Aboriginal people complained about there and here is that anthropologists come in, gather research for their PhD, write up their thesis, they go away, they get a job, and they never see them again. They don't care. They just, not all, but some. They just disappear. I've been with the same people since 1969. I'm still in contact with them almost, I'm, every week almost, I get an email now from some, a contact there keeping me informed about what's going on. It's not pleasant. It's not pleasant at all what's happening. It's terrible. But anyway, so I tried to get back in 1971, and I had a grant from the government and went up to Darwin to get a permit and 
all the doors had shut down. The, gov the government had pretty well closed doors. Uh, nobody would answered the phone, nobody talked to me, nothing. And that was on government money. It wasn't as if I was on my own, right? It was Institute of Aboriginal Studies is government funded. So after a couple of weeks sitting there, R R Ruth and I decided we're just going to take off and go. <laughs> so we got on a plane and we went. Got on a plane, headed over to Groot Island. Got, um, got to the airstrip. And there was some, the Aborigines, of course, I knew them. Asked Nanjiwara, who was one of the leaders, to drive me up to the other settlement. I wanted to go to Umbacumba, the other place where Peter Worsley had been. So he drove us up there in the Land Rover. He said, glad to see you back and all. And got unpacked. The, the council gave us a, a teacher's house because the teacher's holidays. And uh, both councils gave us written permission to stay and do our work there from Angarugua and Umbacumba, both councils. And we were all set to go and uh, got some paintings from some of the artists commission. And then a week later, I got a visit from a patrol officer from Aliangula, the mining town, saying you've got 48 hours to be off the island or you're under arrest and you're gonna, they're going to fly a, a plane and pick you up and take you back to Darwin. I said, why? He said, you're out here without a permit. And I said, but I got permission from the Aborigines. He said, it doesn't matter. It's the government who gives a permit and this is what it is. So we didn't have much choice. I figured, okay, maybe we'll go back and negotiate. So we packed up, got on the plane, went back to Darwin. Boom. All the doors had closed again. Nobody would answered the phone. Nobody had talked to me. So I phoned up my prof in Perth, and he said, "This is outrageous, and you know this can't be happening." And come back to Perth, and we'll sort it all out. So we go back to Perth and nobody did anything. Everybody just said, you're causing too much trouble. You're gonna make it difficult for other anthropologists to work in the field. I'm like, so I just sort of gave him the finger. I said, up yours. We both of us got on a boat and headed back to Canada. Took, another, took a trip and ended up in Vancouver where I got uh, the riot act read to me by Ken Burridge for being, for being what exactly were we doing that was so threatening, right? I mean, I wasn't me now. I was me 30 years old. I, and, and Ruth was, what, 26. It's just young people just trying to do something. No political agenda, really, at all, except, you know. So I came back here and uh, started looking for a job and nothing. Uh, finally, I got an offer from Queen's University to teach introductory sociology. And they, they offered me the job and then the Dean of Arts phoned me up and not, advised me not to take it. <laughs> said, you'll be doing this for the rest of your career. He said, go back to Australia, get your qualifications and stuff. Then I got a, an invitation from John Mulvaney, who was in the um, School of General Studies in um, Australian National University to come back to Australia and set up Aboriginal studies in the School of General Studies at the ANU. And so that's what we did. We went back to Canberra and uh, spent two years there, um, you know, establishing a library courses in Aboriginal studies all in Canada for teaching. There's two schools. There's a research school and a teaching school. This was the teaching school. Um, but in the long run, the distance proved too much. And my father, my brother had been killed and uh, my dad was having a hard time coping with it. So eventually we just decided to come back. So uh, we came back ostensibly to the University of Western Ontario. I was interviewed in Canberra by a prof from there for the job and then I negotiated it over the phone with the head of the department in anthropology there. And uh, it was supposed to be a two-year tenure appointment, tenure stream appointment. You know, you, two years, then you get your tenure and you go. So I thought, that's fine. 
I just kind of wanted to be close to here, which, okay, it's close enough. It's, it's, not, it's not BC, right? So anyway, so Ruth comes back early looking for a house in London. I go back up to Groot Island. By now the government's changed. It's the Labour government and they give the Aborigines permission now for people coming and going. And so of course I, I just went. So I went up there and uh, said hello to people and got myself into a very difficult situation. One of the community, the Umbacumba community was falling apart. It was, um, it was about ready to collapse. In fact, it was collapsed when I got there. And things had happened between 71 and 74 that I didn't know about till I got there. And it, it was really, it was really terrible. 